In another era, when our democracy was tested, Franklin Roosevelt reminded us, in America, we do our part. We all do our part. That's all I'm asking, that we do our part, all of us. Hello, I'm June Hopkins, granddaughter of Harry Hopkins, who was one of FDR's closest advisors throughout his presidency. During the crisis years of the Great Depression, my grandfather's primary concern was to provide jobs for the vast army of unemployed Americans. He helped create and administer one of the most successful and popular New Deal programs, the Works Progress Administration. During World War II, he administered the Lend-Lease Program, providing war materials for our allies. Defeating fascism for him was merely an extension of his work for social and economic justice in the United States. In June 2020, as America was descending into unprecedented crises, historic pandemic, soaring unemployment, climate crisis, and rising threats to our democracy, I joined a group of concerned citizens. We were united by our alarm at the parallels between the crisis then and now, and our hope for a return to bold, pro-people government solutions. The group wrote to Joe Biden asking him if he, if he were to become president to aim even higher than the New Deal. We felt he could be as transformative as FDR in restoring faith in a government that works for ordinary Americans. Since that letter, the group meets regularly and has appeared in dozens of print and digital media. The group I was proud to join last June are the children and grandchildren of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, Henry Wallace, Francis Perkins, Harold Ickes, and my grandfather, Harry Hopkins. Our ancestors saw the suffering of the American people and felt that government had a pivotal role to play in countering the devastating effects of a great economic depression. They fervently believed in the dignity of a job at a living wage. And if the private sector could not provide this, then the US government should be the employer of last resort. They recognized that if they didn't deliver Americans the basics of a decent life, like retirement security, labor protections, and essentials like schools, hospitals, electricity, and transportation infrastructure, Americans might lose faith and be seduced by the empty promises of an unaccountable autocracy. Our purpose is to now remind the American people and our elected representatives that bold, concerted government activism has saved the day before and can and must do it again. I'll now hand it over to my friend David Reamer and to my fellow New Deal descendants for a discussion of how the past can illuminate the future. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. My name is David Reamer, and I'm pleased to serve as the moderator of our, of our final session. Um, I did want to uh, briefly mention Harold Ickes uh, was unfortunately unable to join us today. Uh, Harold has been an active participant in the group's work uh, for over 15 months. He's not here in person, but he's here in spirit and shares his um, solidarity and commitment with what this group has been seeking to do uh, for that stretch of time. Um, the, the members of this panel have already been introduced, so no further introductions are necessary. Um, and I'm going to what I'm going to do is ask each of them a personal question. And then after we've gone through that, uh, I'd like to ask all of them the same common core question that lies at the heart of what this program is all about. To keep us on track, um, I'll be uh, trying to, I'm going to ask people to keep their responses to two to three minutes. Um, and Stephen Sufert uh, is going to help me if anyone on the panel sees his red folder raised in the air, that means it's time to stop, and we're, we're going to keep strict time. I, I should just briefly uh, introduce Stephen. Uh, if you could raise the red folder, stand up. St <laughs> Stephen, Stephen is the one who brought this group together, has been very active in pulling this whole program together. I want to acknowledge him. So, so I want to begin uh, by asking Jim Roosevelt, Jim, you've known about your grandfather and the New Deal all of your life, but you actually knew your grandmother in person because she lived until you were a senior in high school. 
how did her goals shape your view of the New Deal and your own personal commitments? Well, thanks, David, and thanks for everything that you've contributed here. Uh, let me just say first that I hope uh, on the Zoom, uh, June could hear the applause for her message. Uh, uh, I think she so well summed up what we're about uh, here today. I'm also sorry that my friend Harold Ickes uh, was not able to be here today. Uh, most of us uh, directly involved in this effort are uh, grandchildren of New Deal participants. Harold is the son of a New Deal participant, which is really quite remar <laughs> remarkable given that we're in 2021. Uh, and he is still in there fighting for democracy. He, he's on the rules, has been on the Rules and Bylaws Committee that I co-chair at the Democratic National Committee. We don't always agree, but we have great respect and, uh, and affection for each other, uh, even when he's told me I'm destroying the Democratic Party. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then we have a beer. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, so I'm sorry he's not here today. But to go to the question that you've posed, David, um, I did have the, uh, some of my cousins uh, who uh, are a little bit older than I am uh, uh, had as very young children uh, the opportunity uh, uh, to uh, know uh, President Roosevelt personally, uh, uh, including, uh, including my two older sisters uh, who, uh, Oh, one of whom actually passed away last week, I'm sorry to say. Uh, uh, the, uh, but most of the cousins of my generation uh, had in varying degrees the opportunity to know my grandmother, Eleanor Roosevelt. And so my view of the New Deal, actually my view of democracy and, uh, and justice <laughs> uh, uh, is something I grew up with from my, uh, from my grandmother. Uh, and uh, some, again, some, some cousins uh, uh, had more contact with her because they lived here in the New York City area. I grew up in Southern California, but as was she was famous for at the time, she traveled so often, I would see her several times a year when she'd come through Los Angeles, and then periodically we would come to New York City. Uh, and not New York City, New York State, to Hyde Park in the summertime and visit with her. But the uh, real transmission to me of her view of the New Deal as well as her view of our right place in the universe uh, came to me from my uh, father and my mother, but also from her six day a week newspaper column uh, called My Day, which she actually dictated herself every day. It wasn't ghost written. Uh, the, uh, I mean, Full-time newspaper columnists don't write six days a week a anymore. Uh, and she would do that every day. And what I would get from that is her continual focus, first of all, on real people. And uh, FDR referred to her as his eyes and ears. Uh, uh, and that's because she was intent on getting around the country and then in wartime around the world, talking to real people, not just analyzing programs or uh, statistics or policies, but talking to real people. Uh, one of the things that uh, impressed me with that uh, fact, uh, I mean, I, I, I read it every day. I, I, uh, I, from the time I, I, th I actually think I learned to read reading her newspaper column. Uh, and I kind of thought as a, about a four and a half year old, I thought that's how everyone stayed in touch with their grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> if their grandmother didn't didn't live locally, uh, the uh, 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 but she wrote about real people and their real problems uh, and their real feelings uh, every every single day, six days uh, six days a week, and she yes she had she definitely had policy views whether they were on civil rights or uh, jobs or the communities that people lived in. Uh, uh, she was a big, uh, big sponsor of uh, the uh, of the utopian towns that were uh, developed, uh, like Roosevelt, uh, New Jersey, and uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, uh, and uh, and so on. Uh, but again, she focused on real people and the situations that they lived in. The theme, I think, about her concern for real people 
was human rights. And that is symbolized and culminated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which uh, her, became her focus after the death of the president. Uh, and uh, uh, as has been widely reported, but uh, I like to recall every now and then, she's the only, uh, uh, only sort of rank and file delegate who's ever received a standing ovation from the entire UN General Assembly <laughs> when she spoke about, <laughs> uh, about that. Uh, so you, that Jim. human rights of real humans were what her life was about, uh, whether it was civil rights or women's rights. Uh, uh, we would characterize those rights in, in more categorically today than she would have then, but she did that in her life uh, and in what she advocated for. Uh, and so that attitude and that fundamental set of principles is what I think gets us to what we today, as we have had to do in every crisis uh, uh, in my lifetime, what we need to focus on in what we are pushing for in legislation and administration and policy and even statistical record, keep record keeping uh, for that matter. So that's how she uh, influenced my view uh, of what we're talking about here. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I want to turn now to Tomlin Perkins Cogshall. Tomlin, your grandmother had a long-term relationship with FDR, part of which occurred in, in this building, right. which helped her accomplish that long list of objectives that she presented to President-elect Roosevelt uh, to help end the Great Depression. How do you feel that their personal relationship between your grandmother and President Roosevelt, or even before he became president, played a role in their accomplishments? Thank you, David. Um, yeah, I, I, I want, I'd like to discover, you know, sort of discover with you the, um, the length of her relationship back to um, her role in New York City uh, and then New York State government um, as a commissioner uh, of labor eventually, but there, be before they, there was a commissioner of labor position, it was um, a, a member of the Industrial Commission, is what it was called. And um, so she was, she, uh, in 1919, Al Smith appointed her to be on that commission a year before women had the right to vote nationally. And um, so she, she did that and excelled at it and over the years, I think there was one, s one term when Al Smith wasn't in office, but, but uh, she stayed right with it all the way till 28 when he ran for president, and by that time she had become the chair of that commission. So when FDR was elected in 28 to be governor of New York, uh, he inherited my grandmother as the chair of that commission, and quite soon he, s he seemed to you know, proclaim, proclaim that we don't need a whole commission why not you be the commissioner, Francis? <laughs> uh, I'm not quite sure how that step happened, but it did. Uh, so then they had uh, four years together uh, until 1932 uh, to deal with the, the onslaught of the depression here in New York State. And they became friends as well and, and developed trust, I think, too. I know, I'm sure. So um, so when they, when they went on after the meeting in this house upstairs <laughs> where she read her list of demands or, or things that she wanted to work on if, if she was going to be Secretary of Labor. Um, she did have a very nice job here in New York State though, uh, first with those four years with FDR and then Herbert Lehman was the next governor elected and recently we found in the attic in Maine, uh, her family homestead, a certificate where uh, Herbert Lehman is appointing her to be uh, labor commissioner in New York State in 1933. So in January. So clearly she had that in her, in her head or in, in her pocketbook when she came down here to talk to FDR and she knew what he was gonna ask. There were many um, women of the Democratic Division Party who were telling her, you know, Damn it, Francis! If you don't do this, I'll kill you. you know, <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
So she felt a lot of pressure, and Eleanor was, I know, helping uh, convince FTR that it would be a good idea to invite her. And so she was a little bit torn because she had my mom and, and, and her husband here in New York and her great job. But um, so she wrote up the list of shooting for the moon, kind of, to get what she really thought needed to be accomplished. And uh, she might have also been hoping he would say, oh, I don't know, Francis, you know, it's a little bit too much. But no, he, she, he said, great, let's do it. And, and so she did it. And then, th so that's how, and then they got an awful lot done, of course. And, and that's how, I think, based on their trust and friendship, uh, they worked very well together. And uh, she had great ideas, and so did he, and it harmonized well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Two of the panelists here are, are not either children or grandchildren. They're great-grandchildren. And uh, I'm going to uh, now turn to them, uh, beginning with uh, David Giffen. He is the uh, great-grandson of Harry Hopkins and uh, the son of June Hopkins, who we heard on the video. Uh, David, how did your knowledge of your great-grandfather, Harry Hopkins, how did your knowledge of his life and work uh, impact your own work here in New York and perhaps elsewhere in dealing with the issue of homelessness, which is, you know, I know the center of gravity of your work uh, here in, in, in the city? Thank you, David, thank, and, and thank you for including me in this group. Um, there are sort of two parallel courses um, or lines that influenced my life uh, coming from Harry Hopkins and the New Dealers. One is on the personal side and one is more on the policy side. On, on the personal side, obviously we, we grew up in our household hearing quite a lot about Harry Hopkins. Um, you know, the Hopkins clan is a, is a big family and there were many stories told about him and I, I grew up hearing about this guy I was related to who was so influential in the country um, who was always referred to as such a great administrator. And you know, I get these looks of expectation from my family about honoring a great administrator. And I'm, you know, five years old, thinking this is what I want to be when I grow up—a great administrator. <laughs> and then, as I got older, I began to understand what that means. And uh, you know, what it meant was this was somebody who had this facility for moving vast amounts of resources very quickly into the hands of people who need them. And, and that did spark my curiosity to learn more about the man and why he did what he did and what exactly he did. And fortunately, my mother was a historian, so I was able to, to get that knowledge. Um, and what really struck me about him was that he was not driven by ambition. He was driven by compassion. And the work that he did in his early career as a social worker in New York was really what inspired and, and informed everything he did in his life. and and. That's something I think that all of the new dealers share, um, as opposed to so much of what we see today in government. Th this wasn't a bunch of people in the White House circling the wagons to defend some political ideology. This was a group of people who honestly wanted to help suffering Americans and do it immediately. And that's a very inspiring model of government. But then, you know, when I was nine, ten years old and first started to pay attention to politics, it was, you know, Richard Nixon and, and Watergate, and then I'm in college and seeing the Reagan administration, and it was very hard to reconcile those two things, that, well, this was the version of government I saw, I heard about growing up, but this is what I'm actually witnessing that is pretty far away from that. And uh, as a result, it never even crossed my mind that somebody who would want to do something to help people in need would go into the public sector. And I, I'm sad about that because I think there's probably a whole generation of people who might have entered government work but who didn't because of the cynicism that was fostered by witnessing those types of administrations. And, and I, I admit this is a slightly partisan panel we're on here, so I'm probably not going to get a lot of argument on that. Um, but the, w when it comes down to what do you do about it, you know, th th there's a very famous line by Harry Hopkins when a, um, a particular program, a relief program, was being described as being very slow to start but would be good for people in the long run. Uh, he, he famously quipped, well, people don't eat in the long run, they eat every day. And 
it's a great response, right? That's a great comeback. But it, it was also one that really did resonate with me because when you strip away all of the politics and the policies, um, what really matters is helping people and helping them now. And that is what led me, you know, when I started working at the Coalition for the Homeless back in the late 80s, it was by running the soup kitchen. Uh, it has a mobile soup kitchen that feeds about 1,000 people a day. And that was making sure people eat every single day. Um, and and I, I, I'm very sincerely acknowledging that that was informed by the lessons I heard about my great-grandfather. Um, then more on the policy side, um, you know, the New York State Constitution uh, was amended, was revised in 1938, and uh, that was a result of everything that the New Dealers had been doing, and this acknowledgement, this revolutionary acknowledgement that, hey, maybe it is the role of government to take care of those who are in need. Um, in the New York State Constitution, Constitutional Convention of 1938, one of the articles introduced to the Constitution was Article 17, that explicitly states the aid, care, and support of the needy are public concerns that shall be addressed by, by the state, essentially. Not could be, should be, shall be. It is that provision of the New York State Constitution that a piece of litigation in 1981 was based on. Actually, it was brought in 1979 and, and settled in 1981 called uh, the Callahan Consent Decree. Uh, a lawsuit, Callahan versus Kerry, was brought by a lawyer named Bob Hayes based on that article in the state constitution saying that the state has an obligation to shelter people who are homeless. As a result of that, New York City has now, still today, a legal right to shelter. Uh, that, that right was later expanded uh, to include homeless families as well as single adults, men and women. Um, and it was around that litigation that the Coalition for the Homeless that I now run was founded. So that's the sort of policy through line of the, the New Dealers to the New York State Constitutional Convention to Article 17 to Callahan v. Carey. And we're still fighting these battles today. And, and you know, the, the one lesson I think we come from that is when we have these victories, when we have a litigation victory or a legislation victory, that's not the end of the battle. That's the start of the battle. Because once we get those, then we still have to make sure that they are adhered to and the people who are supposed to get help, get help. Thank you. <laughs> Phoebe Roosevelt, um, another great grandchild, great granddaughter of uh, FDR and Eleanor. You've never met them, but you've been an American history teacher and a public interest lawyer, and you now serve on the board of the Roosevelt Institute, which is mentioned up here, a progressive think tank that's one of the sponsors of this event. For, for you, what is most significant about the Roosevelt's legacy today? Um, thank you. Um, first, I want to give a little shout out to my dad and my sister, who are also here. Um, my dad is one of those older cousins that Jim mentioned earlier. Um, and his name is Frank Roosevelt, and my sister Amelia Roosevelt are here in the audience. So I want to acknowledge these other descendants here. Um, uh, and um, I'm going to answer your question about what's significant to me personally about the Roosevelt's legacy um, in three parts. The first part. Um, is, has been the subject of today's conference, which is really uh, the role of government. And I thought that June Hopkins um, said it so beautifully. I wrote it down while I was listening to her right here. Um, it's a pro-people government solutions. Um, and to me, I really see um, that the, that role for, of government as an important counterweight to the private interests of, um, of businesses. Um, and that we really need to have a society that has a pro-people government and a more private, um, uh, they need to, they need to um, balance each other out. And I really do think that the New Deal um, and the legacy of the Roosevelts is emphasizing that the importance of government in that role. 
Um, the second thing that I would take um, that's significant to me about their legacy is really um, does come from Eleanor also, as Jim mentioned for his uh, comments. Um, and um, I feel that Eleanor um, um, not only saw a duty of government um, to its citizens, but also really emphasized the importance of citizens' um, engagement with their government, that citizens um, have a duty to be responsive and um, in a way to um, be active and engaged to give government the power to take care of, um, to be that pro-people government. And I, I think that um, her sort of um, advocacy or um, nudging everybody to, if, if not be as engaged as she was in all the issues, at least to learn about the issues and to go vote and to participate in um, government at all levels. Um, and then the third thing that I um, find significant about their legacy is um, both of their ability to listen and adapt. And I think it's um, telling that we're here on a panel with the uh, brain trust descendants that um, but it also applied to listening to regular people, but it also applied to their ability to adapt to the changing circumstances and the exigencies of the time they were living in. Um, and I really think both of them evolved in their thinking on things. Um, they, they um, evolved in their um, concerns and their solutions. Um, and I think in that way they were both critical thinkers and I would almost say they, were, they had a scientific approach to problem solving um, that I really admire and I think um, is Im important for politics and society. Thank you. So several people on the dais here uh, played important roles in pulling this event together, as well as several people uh, out in the audience. But I, I think it's fair to say that um, Scott Wallace was the key organizer and architect of this event. So before I even ask him a question, I want to thank him for that. And ask other people to thank him for that. Um, So, Scott, the, the programs that your grandfather designed as Secretary of Agriculture were cornerstones of the New Deal. Talk about how his thinking would apply today to the problems we face today. Thank you, David. Um, I, I think it's incredibly relevant today. He, he believed in an activist federal government, that it should be on the side of ordinary working people, especially at a time of great crisis, which is what they inherited. Um, you know, I'll echo what Jim said about uh, Eleanor. Uh, he was a huge fan of Eleanor. They were kindred spirits in the the need for the New Deal to continue and not just uh, not disappear after the war. Um, she was a big fan of his. She uh, convinced the 1940 convention to keep him on the ticket. At, FDR said, I'm not going to run if I don't get Henry Wallace, and the convention was not too sure about that, and she went and gave her speech. This is no ordinary time. you got to give him what he wants. Uh, and uh, <laughs> are my kindred uh, spirit, uh, Francis Perkins. Uh, I love the story about um, my grandfather and her arriving late to the inauguration in March of 1933, and they were both locked out because they didn't have proper identification and they, they sat behind the chain link fence looking in from the outside. That's why you don't see them in the photographs. Uh, but uh, my grandfather believed that the Department of Agriculture was an incredibly important uh, agency for the American people. 
you know, it, recently, as recently as 1890, 90% 90 of the American people lived on the land. Uh, and it, by the 1930s, it was down to 50%, but now it's down to 3%. The, the Secretary of Agriculture was an incredibly important person in the lives of ordinary people. And he said, well, we've got to help not only with financial security, uh, and economic welfare, and he served on the panel with Francis Perkins that designed Social Security. Uh, but also we have to protect natural resources, and that's why our foundation, the Wallace Global Fund, is focused big time on climate, the, the current greatest natural resource challenge. Um, the, the twin things we have to protect. Uh, so he was uh, big on the civilian uh, conservation Corps, uh, soil conservation, he invented the soil conservation program, uh, but he also invented the school lunch program because a lot of kids w weren't getting th any nutrition at all during the day and school was one place they could get it. He invented food stamps because there are families that are so needy they can't feed uh, it, themselves. Uh, it, so it was a, a human challenge and a planetary challenge, and I think that's incredibly relevant today. Uh, what we're trying to do with the Build Back Better plan is take care of the planet. $550 billion ain't, uh, ain't nothing. Uh, and to try to take care of the human infrastructure that Joe Biden talks about that enables the economic growth and independence of Americans. So uh, uh, I'm inspired every day by his... Uh, focus on that and the incredible importance, the role of the federal government in enabling and empowering this. Thank you. <laughs> One of Shakespeare's characters says, what's past is prologue. So we're going to uh, wrap up this panel by asking each of the panelists uh, kind of have a lightning round because I want to be sure we leave plenty of time for Q&A from the audience and our Zoom audience. So I'm going to ask the following question to each of you. Same question. See if you can answer it in about a minute. Um, what is your big, your biggest takeaway from the New Deal that shapes what you think about government's role today? We'll begin with, uh, with Tomlin, skip over to David and Phoebe, then back to Scott, and we'll, we'll finish with, uh, with Jim Roosevelt. Tomlin. Okay. Thanks, David. Um, gosh. Uh, it's hard to, to pin down one thing. Um, I guess the fact that it was done and it worked so well paves the way for us to, to repeat and, and to maybe even improve. But it's, we've proven it's doable. So come on, guys. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you. David? Sure. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I do think there is one kind of fundamental difference between the New Deal then and the New Deal now, um, what it would be now, in that the the problems that it, were, it was trying to address then were precipitated by some structural collapse, right, by the, the economic systems we had failing. The problems it's trying to address now are from the economic systems we have in place actually w working, right, that the, the systems that are in place are not meant to protect people and ensure that they have access to food and to housing and to jobs and to health care. And so while we do need a relief program, and, and y even the, the pared down program that we're looking at now is immensely helpful and will is more than I ever thought we would ever see coming from our government, and I'm very, very thankful for it. But we, we do need to remember that we still have some structural problems that we have to address unless we're going to be begging for a new, new deal for 10 years from now. What, what's, you've talked about this a little, but what's the single biggest takeaway from the New Deal that shapes what you think uh, government's role is today? So I um, think that I wanted to raise the point that was raised a little bit earlier um, by Michael Waldman, which is that the role of government is really shaped by voters and that... Um, so I was going to spend my time talking about how important it is to, um, as he was alluding to, to have voting access and also for people who do have the right to vote to exercise it. 
and um, I thought we had two to three minutes, and I found <laughs> a um, quote from FDR that is so good. So if you don't mind, I would like to read in, in, that about voting rights. Unless um, someone on the panel wants to invoke cloture, you have one more minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, oh. <laughs> okay. Um, because I do think voting is key to being able to define the role of government. So um, he said, and this was unfortunately um, in his campaign for his fourth term, which is a problem, but we're just not going to talk about that right now. Um, he said, nobody will ever deprive the American people of the right to vote except the American people themselves. And the only way they could do that is by not voting at all. This is a little bit of a long quote. It is true, he goes on, that there are many undemocratic defects in voting laws in the various states, almost 48 different kinds of defects, and he uses that number because at that time there were only 48 states, and some of these produce injustices which prevent a full and free expression of public opinion. The right to vote must be open to our citizens irrespective a race, color, or creed without tax or artificial restriction of any kind. The sooner we get to that basis of political equality, the better it will be for the country as a whole. He continues, I'm sorry. <laughs> During this past year, there were politicians and others who quite openly worked to restrict the use of the ballot in this election, hoping selfishly for a small vote the full and free exercise of our sacred right to vote is more important in the long run than the personal hopes or ambitions of any candidate for any office in the land. It is therefore all the more important that we not be smackers. That is his word. We not be smackers on registration day or on election day. So I've never heard the term smackers before. Okay, may, maybe that was a typo. Maybe it was slackers. I don't know. <laughs> but, but let me build on that. Um, to vote, I mean, FDR uh, had wind beneath his wings when he wanted to accomplish something. He had the l huge labor support, especially at the beginning. Uh, he had the people who were fed up with the depression and the economic deprivation. Uh, the, the Citizens Army, you know, the Bonus Army that came and occupied Washington, D.C., uh, was a, a, an enormous movement that empowered uh, FDR at the beginning. Um, it takes a movement. We need movements now <coughs> to lift up uh, the people to vote and to lift up these various issues that, that are percolating through Congress. There's this, the famous story you've all heard about uh, a labor leader, Sidney Hillman, going to FDR and saying, here's what you need to do. And uh, FDR said, well, I, I agree with you. Now make me do it. Uh, and who was it who said, uh, power concedes nothing without a demand? Uh, Frederick Douglass. Uh, it, we need all of us to empower, uh, to lift up, these movements, especially of young people who are saying, you know, you old people are messing up my planet. Uh, and look at the progress they have made in getting $550 billion in climate funding into this reconciliation package. These movements we need to recognize and support and celebrate and lift up. Our foundation gave our second annual uh, Henry A. Wallace Award to the Sunrise Movement for elevating climate. Uh, it, it, so, uh, a word in favor of movements. And last but not least, um, Jim Roosevelt, what's your biggest takeaway from the New Deal that shapes what you think about government's role today? Well, I think it's hard for us today to grasp how cataclysmic the Great Depression was. Uh, we know that today we have the skinniest safety net of any industrial company, country. They had no safety net prior to the New Deal. Everything we've heard about today didn't exist uh, then, uh, prior to Francis Perkins and the, and the New Deal. Uh, 
So they had nothing to fall back on. But remember, if you take the, the Depression starting from 1929 on, only 10 to 11 years before, they had had the equivalent of the pandemic as well. The, uh, although the numbers are different because the population was different, the Spanish flu had the same kind of effect on, the, on society that the pandemic is having today. So you put those together and you see what happens when a society, when a country faces uh, really existential devastation. Uh, we did it a little in reverse order this time. We had the um, near collapse of the economic system in 2008, 2009. Uh, Congress did too little to fix that, so it took longer than it should have <coughs> to fix it. Amazing that it was enough to get Barack Obama reelected so he could kind of get through that with the help of the uh, Elizabeth Warren sponsored financial reforms uh, and so on. And now, then we face the pandemic, uh, the equivalent of the Spanish flu. What the New Deal shows us is that even in a situation that is unprecedented in people's lifetimes or even their memories of stories from their parents and grandparents, government can play a role if it takes action, as we've heard, if it keeps trying when it gets turned back, uh, whether it's by the Supreme Court and we had that in the 30s. We're going to probably have that again. We almost had that uh, and had some of that uh, for the poorest uh, uh, Americans on, the, uh, uh, on Medicaid. Uh, when it gets turned back by obstructionists uh, in the Congress, whether they are racist or uh, royalists or economic royalists, keep trying, keep at it, and you can succeed. Uh, not all at once. You won't see it all at once. You'll see it in the, in the gradual progress and some of the end product. That's what we need to do now. That's why what's happening is what has needed to happen, uh, the sausage-making process of legislation leading to a very significant package that isn't the end of what needs to be done. I think I think we've got time for at least 10 minutes and depending on the panelists and the Roosevelt House could go longer but let's begin the questions and then see where we are at five o'clock so um, here's a question from one of our zoom attendees Bradley Bryn asks um, since you are all descendants of such impactful public servants how can we instill and emphasize the value of public service uh, in young people today given the culture in which we live where so much value is placed on fame and social media detracts from the value of social uh, of public service. And let, let's, let's please answer that, but let's also ask our younger people here to answer that as well. But go ahead, Jim. Or <laughs> um, I, I think it's less an issue of having to teach it to them than not beat it out of them. Um, I, I <laughs> Nancy, you like that. Um, I, I, you know, the, the look, one, one of my big fears as a homeless advocate was that we'd have a whole generation of, of kids that would grow up in New York City thinking that this is the norm, right? Homelessness has been a, a crisis for four decades, and I don't think any of us are surprised when we see mass homelessness. It's been around for so long. And so the fear is then that it gets normalized. But you know, m my kids are now six and eight, and they are appalled, as are their schoolmates, when they see, you know, the public spectacle of human suffering. It, it's a natural thing to want to do something about it, to do something about it now. And you know, I, I think as as Scott was just talking about the, uh, you know, the way we've seen movements rising up now, um, and having such real effect, gives me uh, a, a lot of optimism about what's in the future. I, you know, they should kick us out and take over. We are, you know, we, we, we didn't do it right, but we tried, and it is time to let other people do it. So I think the quick answer to that is to not, not let people get too cynical, not let our kids get too cynical, 
and, and let them know that they should criticize us, open ourselves up to that, and admit that there are better ways of doing things than the ways that we might think are the best ways. I do have one little thing I'll add to that, um, which is that my kids are older from high school to law school, but they use social, they are all quite politically active, and they use social media to get involved on campaigns or um, spread the word about causes and things like that. So I don't think, as much as I hate social media, I do think sometimes it can be a force for good and it can be a source, a way to organize and to get out the vote or raise awareness of issues and things like that. I was really gonna just pick up on something David said earlier, which is that what we, what young people today, and young to me now covers a fairly broad uh, <laughs> spectrum, uh, have suffered from is the Ronald Reagan point of view that government is the problem. Uh, and that devastated, I think, the attitude of young people about public service. We have the opportunity to now, now if we dramatically expand public service, to provide role models. We have a question uh, here, this gentleman. Um, can you hear me okay? Uh, thank you all for being with us. This has been an incredible uh, panel. Um, there's been a debate about Build Back Better and whether it should be focused on doing a few things very, very well or a lot of things to satisfy a lot of different constituencies. And I guess I'm curious as to whether you think um, the New Deal generation would have a thought and lessons learned from the New Deal in terms of how it should inform uh, what Build Back Better ultimately looks like. Thank you. Tomlin? Um, yeah, I, I mean, just one basic thing that I've noticed is I'm not exactly sure what's in it. You know, it changes and changes, and there hasn't been any advertising really, when in, in the New Deal we had those wonderful posters and everything, so there was been a lack of, of, of that, but what should be in it was your question, right? Um, so I'd, I'd, say, I'd say start as much as you can. I wouldn't, I wouldn't limit it, that would be my instinct. I would say start as many, you know, in a reasonable way, with, not with too little, but with a, a good little start and, and hope that future legislation will support it going forward. I would say the, the, the lesson of the New Deal is go big or go home, start big. Uh, politics is the art of the possible. The perfect is the enemy of the good. Uh, we will end up with the, one of the biggest packages in the history of America. Uh, and it won't be have everything that we wanted, just the Social Security didn't. But uh, if people get a taste of something great, uh, hopefully there will be political pressure and movements rising up to say, don't take this valuable thing, this child care, uh, this uh, me Medicare benefit, don't take it away from me. Make it better, and it'll be a process of improvement. But uh, we've got to keep the pressure on. Uh, make them do it. We have time for, uh, we have another Zoom question, then uh, in the back we have a question after your Zoom question, and then we'll, we'll check to see if we should wrap up, but go ahead. This question, this question mentions a grandmother, and I, I think it could be either Eleanor or Francis. Um, Thomas Flanagan asks, how do you think your grandmother persisted through all the sexism of, against women in politics in order to be successful in her role in government? We can, we can go. Yeah, we could do both grandmothers. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, well, she, she was very strategic in how she dressed. Um, partway early on, and it may have been Sarah, uh, Delano Roosevelt, saying maybe you should dress in a very matronly fashion so that you don't, <laughs> you know, get any ideas, or they don't get any ideas, and so that uh, maybe they'll do as you say. Um, and so she was, um, she was working with men, but she didn't try to fight that. She just tried to be, she focused on being effective within that environment. And she didn't try to change it or anything. And she didn't even know about the concept of a glass ceiling or whatever. So, um, and, and FDR had so put her in 
a position so high that there was nobody could could really discuss it. Although she was, and then just one little tidbit, she was um, the first Madam Secretary, of course. And that little anecdote happens in the hallway. She's walking along with a senior statesman, and the press comes rushing up and says, "What should we call you?" Because they, you know, they knew Mister um, Mister Secretary, but they didn't know what to call her. And and, and the senior secret senior statesman, who I'm not sure who it was, said, "You may call her Madam Secretary." <laughs> Fuck. And it stuck. They still do it today. And I would just add that I think that uh, my grandmother uh, did two things. First of all, he just ignored a lot of that criticism. So for example, when the general in the Pacific said, why would he want that woman coming and visiting the troops? She just went and did it. And afterwards, he said it was the most important thing that happened for the morale in the Pacific in all of World War II. Uh, but secondly, she did specific acts to counteract sexism, such as that women were not fully allowed to participate in the press corps in Washington, DC. Uh, even in, in our lifetimes, uh, we couldn't go to the gridiron club dinner and things like that. She would only allow women to cover her press conferences. That was an act of defiance. I will just add one thing to that, which is that I think it's important to also give credit to the women who did come before them. And there were progressive women and abolitionist women. I mean, there is a, also a long history of women um, having an impact on their countries and then the world. And I think both Frances Perkins and Eleanor did follow in the footsteps of Jane Addams and many other um, progressives who they knew. I mean, Eleanor and um, Frances Perkins did know Jane Addams. And I think that there was, we have to recognize that they weren't like the only two defying this trend. But there was some precedent have one question in the back, and uh, then I think we're at um, 5 o'clock, so uh, why don't we take this question, answer it, and then, Scott, I don't know if you want to say any concluding words to wrap up the, the plenary session, but um, go ahead. Yes, hi. This is less a question than a brief comment. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the center of his attention was brought as a moral imperative for people to exist. He said this over and over again. It wasn't just giving them a paycheck, but it was important to their identity. And that is something that we need to have carry over today um, under the Biden plan, is how critical that is for both men and women. The second point is Eleanor Roosevelt and Phoebe began to touch on this um, and other comments about her column. Her writings about democracy have not been recognized as an important body of work. She started writing about this in a more serious way during the war, not surprisingly, then during her UN work, and then continuing on. And people should go back and reflect on what she had to say about democracy generally and citizen participation. So I think those two elements really frame the core principles of the New Deal for Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. I probably should wrap up, but... Um, uh, sure, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Jim as the uh, the householder here. But uh, let me just say, we are at an inflection point, a very un incredibly important point in, and that's the point of this conference. Uh, is government going to be uh, returned to the New Deal paradigm? Biden has talked about a paradigm shift. Uh, FDR talked about a shift from laissez-faire Hooverism to a government that is actively, you know, FDR started out as a deficit hawk. He said, there's nothing more important than a balanced budget. And then he came in and said, well, we've got huge crises. We've got to spend, we've got to invest. These are investments that we're talking about uh, in people and in the, it will grow the economy. Are we going to have a return to that paradigm of a government that is actively beneficially on the side of the American people and people who want to be American people? Uh, so 
I, that's why we're doing this. That's why we started the dialogue with President Biden back as candidate Biden to, to try to point out the historic turning point that we are at and to nudge him along and be the wind beneath his wings or whatever metaphor you want to use. So. <laughs> yeah, so thank you again to you, Scott, and you, David, and uh, Stephen, and everyone behind putting, uh, putting all this uh, together. It is so appropriate that we're doing it here in this house where FDR started his conversations with Francis Perkins. Uh, and I really think that what we're about as a group and what I think this, this conference is about uh, is just what FDR asked for. I agree with you, now go and make me do it. Uh, that's what we're trying to say to Joe Biden. Uh, we are pushing you to do it. We're not disagreeing with you, of course, but we are saying don't be held back by those obstructionists. Don't be held back by all those particular interests out there, whether it's interests in uh, property or coal or, uh, uh, or simply anti-government uh, or even political partisanship. Uh, it needs to be done. That's what we're talking about here. Go to it.